I have the pleasure to open the lightning talks tonight. I will be talking about uh, sharing is caring or how you can become a better developer. My name is Laura Vardarova. My Twitter handle, very easy, just my name. I'm a JavaScript uh, engineer and I'm also quite passionate about uh, agile software development and I have, um, I'm the creator and maintainer of the awesome agile software development list that you can find on GitHub and where you can learn more about it. Okay, so what is uh, sharing and scaring and why I want to talk about it? There are three parts in my talk. I will start with uh, sharing. What does it mean? Uh, I will talk uh, about sharing in the sense of giving back. We know that we all have uh, learned a lot from the community. There are a lot of uh, free resources that we can gain a lot of knowledge from. Uh, we are here at this uh, fantastic conference. We learn so much from all these speakers. And there comes a time when it's time for us to give back, to share and give back. There, I want to talk about a couple of ways in which you can do that. I will start with mentoring. It's very important to mentor people who are starting in this industry, to mentor junior developers who you work with. How else you can give back? Blogging and or, and or speaking like our speakers tonight did, you can also share your knowledge uh, writing blog posts. And uh, lastly, open source contributions. Uh, this is a great uh, way to get, uh, to get more experience uh, and to show the world what you know. And you never know where an open source contribution can take you, actually, because I know many people who are nowadays even getting paid to work on uh, open source projects. Which brings me to the second point about caring. And I want to talk to connect the sharing to the caring and, and show you how they are actually connected. Caring is a lot about uh, growing, growing others and growing yourself. So by caring, you can help to grow your community. Being at a conference like this one, you connect to your community and uh, you, you help this community thrive and grow. By going to uh, meetups, you do the same. By um, sh contributing to open source projects, you again help your community grow. Then you help grow your peers or the people you work with. By collaborating with them and sharing your knowledge, you help these people grow and also become better developers. And lastly, it also helps you to grow yourself because the more you speak and the more you blog and write about the, peop the things you have learned, um, it, you grow as a, as a developer because you learn more, you um, have people ask you more questions, you, you try to explain things um, to other people and you really need to be able to explain yourself really well. And that's how, when you really understand things and get deep into the topic. So why do it at the end? Okay, sharing is caring, but why do it? And what's in it for you? What are the personal benefits? Again, three things. First, as I said, expertise. The more you blog, the more you speak, the more you mentor, the better you become because people will uh, come and ask you questions that you never thought of. Uh, and then you, you, you tell yourself, oh, I never thought about it, so I'll go back and research it. The next time I talk or I mentor someone, I can share this. And then it's, it's really great. That's something that I like the most about uh, giving talks. Better relationships is the second thing, the second benefit for you. Because the more you mentor people, the more you help them, the, the more you help the people you work with, you build better relationships with these people because everyone likes people who help. And it will make you ultimately a better team player. And lastly, happiness. Because it's uh, scientifically proven that when you help others, it makes you very, very happy. And that's the, um, we get the biggest satisfaction from helping others. So this is a great, great benefit. So I really encourage you to share your knowledge with others and to care about the community you belong to and help it grow. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm Chris. I'm talking a little bit about uh, how I boosted my dev team's confidence or why, uh, why they loved me f uh, afterwards and hated me first, uh, vice versa. Um, I am a senior front-end engineer at uh, this uh, great company. Uh, besides that, I'm a, a front-end enthusiast, musician, and a dad. And um, yeah, 
I'm a little bit talking about um, code sanity and how you can uh, assure a good code sanity. And a um, good thing to start is um, to think about the future. So when you're setting up a project, you should consider um, using great tools to uh, assure that your code is uh, providing a good quality in the end. And there are great uh, open source tools you can use to uh, simply set up a dev environment that uh, enables you and your whole team to um, achieve this uh, mighty, mighty goal. And uh, yeah, for example, Git hooks uh, is very nice to automate things and um, they are prettier for like code formatting stuff, style lens, ES lens to get decent quality uh, in your CSS, for example, or SS uh, style, style code in general. And for example, Jest, which is uh, pretty simple to set up uh, to have a decent, uh, uh, decent platform to run your unit tests. And um, this is, uh, I think, a typical workflow. Uh, your developer change code, uh, they add it, they commit it, they push it, and then the CI build failed. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's uh, going crazy. And uh, the bad thing here is everybody's going crazy before, uh, uh, because uh, yeah, the CI, when the CI build fails, every developer is like uh, going nuts, they can't work and it needs to be fixed. And a uh, pretty, pretty simple thing is to add a, a step in between. Um, and I did it and I really liked that, <laughs> but uh, people hated me first and loved me afterwards. Because I used NPM test to um, to run in the uh, pre-commit hook uh, using Husky, and I haven't uh, uh, I haven't uh, annotated these steps here, but uh, in the end, the uh, npm test uh, will just run automatically whenever someone tries to commit to your repository, and when the test fails, um, now good things first. When the test passed, they can push, and everything everything is fine. Uh, if they fail, um, they have to change code, and uh, then only the commit failed. So it's just their problem. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you if you if you're a good team member, you will help them uh, maybe uh, fix fix their problem, um, like uh, doing some configs in their editors to automatically uh, fix uh, code styles or stuff like that. And yeah, here are the cons. Uh, you can't instantly commit your code, uh, you've just coded, and um, you might optimize your uh, linting and testing performance if your um, project grows and grows and grows and the unit tests uh, run like three minutes or so and you can't commit, this might be frustrating. <laughs> and your devs might punch you first. But in the end, uh, you're uh, enforcing them to uh, get nearly no red builds in your CI uh, environment. And this is a quite cool in our latest project. Um, we only had those red, red, red mails when, um, uh, for example, the, the dev server were down or the testing uh, staging environment was down, but not when our code failed. And you have like no bad code ever in your Git history because they can't commit to your Git history. And it doesn't mean that your app can't fail, but when it fails, at least the code looks good. <laughs> and um, you have consistent code from the very beginning, um, and that's, uh, I, I think, pretty nice thing. And in the end, when everything is uh, going good, devs will love you and thank you, and once they get used to quality assurance, they will love you even more. <laughs> um, some more links. Uh, at Nemix, we have some uh, default configurations you can use. Um, we're not the only company that uh, provides uh, some default configurations uh, for your quality assurance. Airbnb does it, Walmart does it, and this is quite helpful because uh, some people have put their brains into these configurations. They're uh, opinionated in the end, but you can use them if you want to. And um, yeah, it's like, uh, this, this is not a quote I found on the internet. I've, uh, I thought about uh, about how can how can I express my thoughts about this uh, when I when I was sitting at the at the sofa, and I think is uh, yeah caring for unwritten code is like <laughs> caring for the unborn children, <laughs> and that's the dad in me speaking. <laughs> so uh, thanks. Hi, my name is Manuel. I'm a front end developer from Vienna and I'm specialized in web accessibility. 
Estelle told us earlier that HTML is accessible by default, and it's fast, and it's our job to not fuck it up. And I'm going to show you a few more things to not fuck up. Uh, the first thing is a document outline. We can create a document outline by defining headings, h1 to h6. And a sound document outline is great because it conveys document structure. Um, we can use headings to break our content down into smaller chunks, which is, again, great for re readability. A document outline, a sound document outline, is important for SEO, and it also provides screen reader users with an additional way of navigating. So screen reader users don't necessarily just read the content on a page from top to bottom, but they have different shortcuts and other ways of navigating. For example, here, we have some headings, and I'm using voiceover. And what the screen reader does, unfortunately, we don't have sound, but what the screen reader does is it reads all the headings. So it will read fruits, heading one, apples, heading two, um, golden delicious, heading three, and so on. So it just doesn't just read the contents of the heading, but also the level. So having properly ranked headings is incredibly important because it helps screen reader users understand how the document is structured. So that's very important. Heading level one. Oh. Fruits. Heading level 2, apples. Heading level 3, gold and delicious. Heading level 4, a key to gold. Heading level 4, grip stick. I'm so thankful that this is working right now because uh, I didn't want to try to uh, mimic a screen reader in the other demos, so I'm going to show you now. Um, another thing we shouldn't do is to just use H1s, for example. There was once. Do you hear me? Hey, okay. Uh, there was once um, part the HTML5 document outline was part of the spec where it says that we can use any heading if we are nesting it in, in sectioning content. This isn't implemented in any browser. Please use um, properly ranked headings. Another thing uh, which is quite interesting in HTML is the language attribute. We can use it on the HTML element to define the natural language. For example, here I'm setting the language of this document to English. I have a quote here, and I set the language to English. And I want you to pay, pay close attention to the quotation marks as I change the language from English to German. So what happens is that the quotation marks change because they're differently in German. And if I now change it again to Russian, they change again. And Chrome also asks me if I want to translate this page from Russian to German or English because it thinks that it's Russian because it defines the language in the HTML attribute. So setting this is incredibly important. Here I'm on Windows and I'm using the JAWS screen reader to read the exact same quotes. The language is set to English and this is what it sounds like. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates, semicolon, you never know what you're going to get. That's great. But now if I set the language to German, this is what we get. Me mama always said, life was like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get. Kind of sounds like me. <laughs> so what the screen reader does, it, it picks the voice profile for the screen reader according to the language set in the HTML attribute. You can use the language attribute not just on the HTML attribute, but pretty much on any um, element. For example, here I have the sentence, there's a certain je ne sais quoi in the air, and it makes a difference. So the first example here has no language attribute, and the second one has it set to FR, which is French. No language attribute heading level 2. There's a certain je ne sais quoi in the air. With language attribute heading level 2, there's a certain je ne sais quoi. In the air. So the pronunciation is way better in the second example. So language attribute is important for assistive technology, for translation tools and browsers, for uh, quote quotation characters, also for date and number inputs, for search engines, of course, and for CSS hyphenation. Next thing, landmarks. In HTML, we can define semantic regions in our document, documents using landmarks. They also provide another way of navigating the web for screen reader users, which I'm going to show in a second. They are not a replacement for divs, so use divs for CSS and JavaScript stuff, and landmarks for semantics. Like, okay. 
Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with header, footer, for example, are uh, landmarks, or also this form with the role attribute set to search. And uh, we can use shortcuts again in screen readers to jump, for example, from landmark to landmark. So here in VoiceOver, I'm listing all the landmarks, and I can jump to a specific landmark just because I defined it in HTML. OK. And another quick tip, if you're using Twitter, <laughs> if you have hashtags with multiple words, please use camel case. And this is why. Just use camel case for landmarks, uh, for hashtags. Hi, my, my name is Andre. Uh, I'm on a rush here. <laughs> I'm one of the co-organizers of React Vienna, so I'm from Vienna. Uh, not originally, originally from Russia, uh, but I live in Vienna. Um, and and it's, it's a wrong presentation. I'm, I'm really sorry about it. I have a special short version, but somehow, oh, I guess it's an, uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I don't know how it happened. I need a short one, but it doesn't. Oh, I see, I, I fucked it up. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Don't change anything before the presentation. So, <coughs> okay, still making, make LinkedIn great again. Um, yeah, and this is what I was missing. So we organized a conference uh, about Reason in Vienna this year. So uh, if you're into Reason, you should come to Vienna in May. Um, and let's get back to the topic, what web is Lint? <laughs> so there's a definition from Wikipedia, which is like, Yoda, 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 lint is a linter, blah, blah, blah. I made a short one, uh, which is linter is a tool that finds stupid blocks point. Um, and this is how it looks for me when I work with code base. So you see this red marks here. Um, so then I open such file, I usually, I can't think about the code and I can't read it until I can figure out this thing, which is, which looks like this for me. So it takes all my, like, all place in my mind and makes me think. Um, so how do we fix this? Right, so we linked all the things and uh, we had a presentation before how to do this, so I'm not talking about it at all. Um, but actually what's important is uh, that on average software developers spend 50% of their time finding and fixing bugs. Uh, and it costs a lot of money apparently. So if you don't lint, you literally just burning money. But in reality everyone knows that uh, in reality, we spend time doing different things. <laughs> and it usually looks like this, right? <laughs> so there are two guys, I'm one saying, hey, I'm using tabs now. <laughs> and then third guy comes in and says, hey, I, I don't care. And yeah, bad things happen to third guy. And he's not like, he, you know, he, his intent was clean. He wasn't like, he didn't mean it bad. <laughs> so how do we fix this? Uh, yes, we use free tier. <laughs> And it's easy to install free tier. Um, and this is kind of a recap. Uh, so linting uh, let us do fewer bugs and it leads to the better readability. But sometimes it can slow us down, how we saw before. And so, okay, typical day, mine. So I'm cutting, I'm cutting, I'm fine. When I'm, when I'm doing PR, PRs are cool. And then 10 minutes later, I get an email. <laughs> Build failed. So we saw it before. And I go to, and I think like, yeah, everyone's running around, like everything is burning, but it's a missing semicolon. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God, not again. So I go back fix the <laughs> semicolon, <laughs> push the code, it's green now, it's so cool. Um, but still I, I somehow think, ah, it doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel right. Raise your hands who have been in that situation. Okay, that's uh, pretty much everyone. Um, that pack. Oh, fix, what is it, fix indentation, fix linting, fix up, fix, yes, lint issue, whatever. Just single page, didn't even start scrolling. One day. So I, I searched, I searched GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 500,000. So I searched again, wait a minute, wait for it. Almost three fucking million. 
people fix an indentation on GitHub. This is embarrassing. And it's like, I wish I could lean before committing changes to the repository. It should be basically everyone, right? Um, and where are Git hooks, right? So you can, you know, install Git hooks. Git hooks, uh, even like smart people don't know how to install Git hooks. There must be a problem. Okay. So it's hard to set up, hard to manage, hard to share cross the team. This is the most important thing mm -hmm. for me. And it's easy to do with Husky. We saw it before. And this is how you do it. Uh, you install Husky, then you do pre-commit ESLIN dot. And then 10 minutes later, oh yeah, we found 6,000 errors in your code. Uh, it's not what I expected, right? Um, so Husky is cool, <laughs> but linting the whole project on every pre-commit hook, it takes a long time, it, it displays some completely irrelevant things because we didn't change these files, right? So what if we could run linters on the files we're about to commit? Hmm, mid lead stage. This is the project I created and maintain. It's open source, it's also easy to install. Um, and the only thing you need to change is, yeah, instead of ESLint you do lead stage and pre-commit hook. And then this is the slide I fucked up before. <laughs> uh, you, yeah, you do lean staged and dot GS ESLint. And this is how it looks like after this change. So here I have just a single file that I want to commit, which is in, in, in git index, and then I do git commit. It only run ESLint on this single file, and it doesn't lint all the other changed files or files in my repository, which is much better, right? So apparently git hooks, hooks are awesome, and I'm almost done because there's more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm skipping, I'm skipping there's more, because you can fix errors, you can do auto fix, you can reformat your code with Prettier. <laughs> and this is how it looks like, this is, this, I promise this is my last one. Because <laughs> it's so beautiful. So someone wants to commit bad code, bad guy, bad girl, bad developer. And then suddenly, bam. Git show, git show. Done. Thank you. Yeah. So it works. It works with any other languages with reason. You can use it with reason. Reason. <laughs> and <laughs> it's it's an it's <laughs> okay. Don't do this. Okay. Don't do this. Install in staged and solve real problems. Thank you. All right, so I want to give you a quick introduction to uh, Git Bisect um, because I think more people should know about Git Bisect. Uh, just to get a quick feel, uh, how many of you have won uh, bisecting in Git before? Show of hands. Okay, I would say maybe a quarter of the room. Um, so let me quickly set the scene for you. Uh, we have a Git repository and we are currently on our master branch. You can see on the right here and we found a bug in our application. We know that the bug doesn't occur in our release version, the version 4.2 on the left there, um, but it does occur on master. And so here's the challenge. How do we find out which one of these commits in between, and there could be hundreds of them, um, introduce that one specific bug in our application? This is where Git Bisect steps in. Um, we first start our session uh, simply by running Git Bisect start, and then we have to let Git know which one of our commits is the bad one and which one is the good one. So we just tell Git uh, our master is currently in a bad state and our version 4.2, the release version, is in a good state. And just with these three commands, uh, Git will tell us that there are like 675 revisions left to test, but it only takes roughly 10 steps to go, over, go through all these commits and find that one specific one uh, that introduced our bug. And this is because uh, Git does uh, something called a binary search. Uh, so it chooses the most optimal path to find that one specific commit. And what exactly do I mean by that? Um, it kind of looks like this, where Git checks out the commit right in the middle between those two. This is where our head is right now. And Git asks us again, is this a bad commit or is this a good commit? And let's say this is uh, also a bad commit, so we tell Git again, Git bisect bad. And now Git can eliminate all those commits on the right side 
and only focus on the left side. So just with that, we have limited, eliminated like 350 revisions or so, and have nine steps left to go. Um, so Git does the same again, chooses the commit in the middle on the left side, and asks us again. Now this happens like nine steps, and in the end, Git will tell us the one specific commit that was the first bad commit. And this is the commit that introduced the bug into our application. So, as you can see, with just a few commands, we traversed through hundreds of commits in our application and found out where this specific bug was introduced. And this is really the most basic use case uh, about Git Bisect. If you know that, uh, you're very well equipped to uh, find to debug bugs using that. Um, there are a few more things I would love to talk about uh, about Git Bisect. For example, there's Git Bisect 1, where you could just pass a command and automatically run your tests, for example, and you don't have to do that whole, is this a good commit, is this a bad commit, uh, dance all by yourself. It will automatically do that for you. Uh, there are also a few more things, um, but I think that's just enough for a lightning talk. So I would suggest uh, you just check out the documentation page about Git Bisect. Uh, you can find a link to that uh, on the talk page right there. Uh, the slides for that talk uh, are also available there. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your time and have a great evening. I think I'm the only one who hasn't prepared the slides because I didn't know I was going to speak. So sorry for the hustle or for the chaos. Uh, my name is John. I'm a front-end developer, I'm a clean code enthusiast, and I'm creating the web since 1996, so I'm quite an old guy. You see my gray hair, so. I'm working at Gesagetan. We are the guys with a truck, food truck outside, so you have to check it out. It's really good. So, I've committed two talks, so I have to double the time, but I have not 80 slides, I have about, wait, 21. So, be aware, I don't need that much time. The old way, you can do it with SAS or less, with variables, but at the end you end up something like this. You have a body, you have a background, and then you have a media query or something like that, and then you reassign the, the value. That's the old way. That's the way we know it from years and years. And now, we can start to use CSS variables. And again, I don't want to explain you all the whole stuff because you can all read for yourself. I just want to make you hungry. You know, hungry for the new stuff, hungry to try it out. Because in five minutes, you've forgotten all the stuff I said. But if you remember that you're going to be hungry, that you're going to try it, that you're going to use it. That's my goal. So I can swipe fast through the slides. So yes, the new way. You declare variables and you call them. That's it. So for example, if you have made a query, you don't have to reassign all the stuff. You just change the variables and you're set up. You have like here global variables and you can also use local variables and you can read the variables in JavaScript really easy and you can set the variables in JavaScript and if you want to know more about the one or two or three weeks there are some talks from from this conference online on YouTube and you have to watch the talk from Mike there you see a lot more that you have also resources all this kind of stuff it's a really good talk it was this afternoon, I didn't know he was talking about that. So go and watch it and use it. So the second one is that you don't gonna need flex by uh, some frameworks. Some who of you uses Bootstrap from Twitter? And now all the hands up because I know I, uh, almost everybody use it or foundation or some kind of CSS grid framework. It's good if you just use sometimes 
me also just use the grid, you know, just import the grid part and use that. But now we got some really, really cool tools. Flexbox and grid. And I'm really excited about that because in the first time of history, the web, we can create really nice markup, we can create really nice layouts, we can create with a few lines of code really nice layout that wasn't possible before. So, your markup will be simpler, less code, less error, right? Make it easy, make it you readable. And that's a short example. You see just a header, a nav navigation, a main, and a footer. And with these few lines, you get this kind of layout. If you would try it with float, you would need much more wrapping. If you do it with flagbox, also. If you do it with tables, shame on you. So, when to use what? Some people say, ah yes, now we have grid, we don't need flexbox anymore. That's not true. Because flexbox is content driven. So you can create really nice effect. You don't need that much meta queries anymore because you can decide the content, how it's gonna look, how, br how wide it's gonna be, and all the kind of stuff. And grid is kind of layout driven. So for grid, you use layout, and for content, you can use Flexbox. Yes, I have two of them. Two talks, wait. So, <laughs> that's the last slide. <laughs> One of the last. Here you have some resources. At the end, just Google it. You will find it. You are a developer, you know how to use Google. That's my daughter. And something you, we can learn from her. Stay hungry. <laughs> Stay foolish, like Chief, uh, Chief Steve Jobs said. Stay foolish, stay hungry, and never stop learning. Thank you very much. Here are my Twitter handle and my company I'm working on. Okay, it's me again. I had the pleasure to open these lightning talks, and I have the pleasure to close them. I'm going to talk to you about uh, how to keep your sanity with time management. So this talk is going to be how to give a lightning talk in three minutes. <laughs> no, I'm joking. That's not what it is about. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is how to keep up with uh, the popping up technologies. As I said, I'm a JavaScript developer. And very often, I would go to sleep, wake up, and find out that there was a new UI framework released or a new tool. And I'm often overwhelmed, and I feel like, okay, I, I, I'm losing it. I don't have time to learn all these uh, new things. And then what happens when you go on vacation for two weeks, and you come back and you think, oh, that's it. I am, I'm completely lost. I need to find a, a new job or uh, do something else. I'm out of the market. Um, what I also didn't mention earlier is that I also have a three-year-old son, and so many days feel like I just wake up, open my eyes, and then in the blink of an eye, it's time to go to sleep again. So I figured out I really have to work on uh, improving my productivity and becoming a master of productivity. Um, yes, as I said, you only have that much time in a day, and you really need to learn to use it efficiently. First thing that is very, very important is to plan. I can't stress this well enough. I um, started by writing down the things that I'm doing to find out which are the things that actually are not um, giving me anything. So how do you plan? You really need to identify the things that are really important and urgent and focus on doing these things now. This will also help you to find the things that you can delegate to other people and who don't require your input. And it's also quite important to set a very realistic plans. It means you always have to plan for the implant because there will always be things that are out of your control and will come up and you have to do. So make realistic plans. Don't plan for 100% of your time. 
maybe 60 to 70 percent will be fine. And really focus on doing the things that are really important to achieve your goal and things that are really urgent and you just have to do. Second thing, very, very important, learn to say no. This is one of the most important things. And now, I'm not saying uh, say no to everything. No, I'm not saying that. But of course, how, how, how would you do it? You could, of course, say, well, I really would like to help you, but I also have my own goals and priorities, and I have this huge list of things that I have to do. So I'm sorry, but I can't help you at this time. You also have, obviously, your own life, and you also need the time to rest. So you can't always say yes to any single request. And most importantly, if you say yes to everything, you won't have time to say yes to the things that are really, really important. So yes, say no, that's really, really important. Last part is about focusing. As we know, as developers, we really need to focus in order to be productive, because usually it, it might take 30, to one hour, 30 minutes to one hour to get productive and get into the problem, understand, and understand the problem. And if someone interrupts you, this time is lost, and then you have to start all over again. So focusing is really, really very important. And I want to give you a couple of tips on how you can achieve that. First, that's probably for many of you is uh, easier said than done, but turn off your so social media notifications. You can't imagine how much they are stealing from your time. Because just by having them, and you think this is something uh, small that uh, just pops up on your phone or on your screen, but it's super destructive, and really it doesn't help you to focus fully enough. So turn off your social media notification, you will never regret it, you will feel so much better. There's nothing that you're missing. Talking about this, checking email and chat, and again, social media. Make it a habit to check it at specific uh, times, or uh, let's say every couple of hours, or you could do it like just before lunch or just after lunch, but don't do it constantly. Set specific times at which you check your emails and chats. Again, I'm sure that if someone really needs to um, find you or needs something very urgent from you, they will come to you. So emails and chats, they are not for urgent stuff. You can live without them for a couple of hours for sure. And last, that's uh, another great tip that really works very well for me, yeah, I'm almost done, is work when there's nobody around. So if you have the privilege of having a job where you can use uh, flexible uh, working hours, you could either start, ve start very early, as I do, I usually go to the office very early, there's no one and this is my most productive time of the day, or you could also go later and maybe uh, work a little bit in the evening or move your lunch break so you go to have lunch um, when the rest of your colleagues are back or something like this. You could also uh, request to work from home some days and then have this productivity time once in a while. It really helps. So I hope that these tips will help you and you will also become productivity masters. Thank you.